Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at this zine that I was sent through Old Tan's door. I know I love my OSR zines, as people who watch this channel probably know, and this is especially impressive. Uh, one of the main reasons is that it is not printed through DriveThruRPG, through Print on Demand. This thing is hand assembled out of some extremely high quality components. So the paper quality is just excellent, and it's great to see something that's really hand built like this being shipped out to people. It's just a very deluxe product. Uh, here's our back cover right here. And the general premise here is that uh, this was created by Ben Lawrence and it takes place in his dreamland setting. So this is the first issue out of a projected series, I hope, of issues. And it has a doorway, the doorway through Old Tan's shop that uh, opens up at one point and takes you into the a city that's floating above the dreamlands. So it is a Narnia-like door into another world. Now, the first thing you probably notice upon receiving a zine like this is that, A, this part pops out. So it's an encounter table written almost like a menu. I think that's really great. Since it detaches from the book, you can have it off to the side and reference it very, very easily. It has all the information you need to know there for this section of his setting. Secondly, you're probably going to notice that the cover itself is detachable. It just comes off like this. And why you ask? Because there's a dungeon on the inside. That is such a great idea. And the downside, of course, is that it makes the book a little fiddly because the cover comes off of it. But it's just so much fun to pull it off and have yourself a little dungeon. The cartography is quite great, uh, is quite good. Uh, but the one thing that I noticed while I was reading through it, however, is that there are definitely some parts where the numbering of the rooms is much too small to read clearly. Uh, there are bits where the numbers are just, you can't really read them. They're just very small. Uh, or like room number 14, you'll spend a long time looking for it. You know that it's in this area, but the 14 is like hidden off to the side over there. So some of that I think could have been made larger and more clear because I spent a little too long looking for the room references while I was going through this module. It's a fairly small quibble, but it's there. So going on to our table of contents. So this is, uh, you have Old Dan's door, the actual entrance to this other world, and the main dungeon, which is here, the ruins of the Inquisitor's Theater, along with a bestiary and some spells. We have a general introduction. The uh, graphic design is really good. It's very simple, it's very clean, and the art complements it excellently. Old Tan's door. So you find a, you can set this anywhere in any sort of normal fantasy city. You just need a, uh, a shop run by a man named Old Tan who has a door that has opened up in his shop mysteriously. He doesn't know why. But going through this door takes you to a city in another world. You have some rumors about Old Tan's door. For example, my brother saw three hardened mercenaries go into the shop and came out again an hour later, lar larded with bags that clinked and jingled. So it's a great way to incentivize players to invade this other world, especially if they are into gold. Reasons for venturing through. So if you don't have gold as an incentive, you can have lots of story-based reasons for going on this expedition. Especially good if you're running this as a one-shot, I think. Basic description of Old Tan's shop. These stats here... Uh, appear to have descending armor class, so it looks like it is written for uh, the very early editions of D&D. Though, of course, like most OSR stuff, conversion is very simple. And we start going into the actual dungeon. So basically, the idea here is the door from Old Ten's shop is right there in number one. And from there, you can start making your way around this uh, dungeon labyrinth. It's a great design dungeon. There's a lots of variety in the encounters, which is always important. There's lots of uh, interconnections and loops, right? You got like a loop here, a loop through there, there's loops over there, there's loops going all the way around there, which means that there's lots of different ways you can get at problems. Also, there's ways for enemies to flank you, to come up from behind, and all that sort of thing. We have a number of factions. Uh, which is always great for any sort of medium to large size dungeon. You have the guildless, who are people that have been exiled from this city and are living down in the sewers below. And the white swine, these uh, really creepy pig-like guys that have children's hands that sneak around uh, trying to uh, gain victims to feed to its their giant bloated 
pig mother. It's pretty horrifying. And we have the Weaver of Shadows. We have some interesting encounters, including shadow puppets, which are pure black ornate shadows with feathered turbans and elaborate armor and weapons. So they look like Indonesian shadow puppets. We have an Oniric pudding, like a dream pudding. The Ravens of Perjury, Sewer Worms, and some uh, apprentices. Along with a, uh, I think he's a cleric, Shaltromo. And Explorers, because uh, this door opens up uh, into Old Tan's shop. So not only are Explorers going to be coming there from our world, but you're also going to be getting Explorers from the upper layers of the city, because this dungeon takes place in the sewers below a city. So you're going to have people venturing down that way as well. Basic description of all of our rooms. As the dungeon starts, the factions are in place in a number of places. They all have motivations and things are set up in a very logical fashion. So you know why these people are in this particular place and you know how they would act. So there's definitely some uh, negotiation and there is ways that you can ingratiate yourself with different factions. If you're careful. If you go full uh, murder hobo, then as usual, you're probably going to have a really bad time. You have these really creepy like automata that are all over this uh, Inquisitor's Theater. Because in this fantasy city or this, uh, this fictional city that you have gone to, uh, the Inquisitors have this very like, Baroque, almost theatrical way of interrogating people. And they have these automata that help them out. A Shrine to the Pickled Prince. I love the illustrations. They're very Baroque, they're very Gothic, and they provoke just the right amount of weird and horror to really evoke the setting that this is going for, along with a certain dreamlike quality, which is, of course, very appropriate. Uh, there's a, a couple little misprints. For example, there's like a little bit of ink um, on this page, probably from over here, but again, it's not a big deal. The printing in general is extremely clear and crisp. And even the paper quality, it's a little bit off-white. It just has like this nice glow to it. It's great. It feels great in the hand. Moving on to the section at the end, we have a bestiary. So we have the Ravens of Perjury, which is a tangle of black conjoined bird's wings surrounded, surrounding a single unblinking eye. It's a great little image there. They can also affect you with a sleep spell. And an oniric pudding. which of course contains lots of uh, great juices and goos that you can use in potion making. We have spells. I love these spells because they are perfectly suited to the theme of uh, inquisitorialness, which this whole dungeon is based around. So we have testify. So when you cast it, the person who cast the spell is uh, unable to uh, reply with a falsehood. You can't basically speak falsehoods if someone asks you a question but you cast it on yourself. So it's a way to prove that what you're saying is true. Although of course you can try and you know twist the words of the person asking you questions to get around that. You also have chain of evidence. So to cast this spell, you have to touch an object. The spell reveals the identity of the sequence of individuals who have touched this object in the last one day per caster level in the order in which they have handled the object. So that is a great spell if you're running any sort of investigative game, right? Touch an object, who else has touched this? You might not get a perfect you know, uh, proof of guilt, but you're going to get lots of really great leads that you can go on to build a case if you're running an investigative game. And we have champions. Just, uh, there is a Weaver of Shadows, like a giant spider type thing. And if you accept its gift, there is some information in that that I'm not going to get too into right now. Uh, it'll pierce you with its needle legs and inject a black ichor uh, from which it spins its shadow puppets. So you become the champion of a particular god along with the um, conditions that go along with that. I really enjoy that um, because it's not just the way that the way that clerics normally, you have a god, but the god doesn't really come into the game that much. It's not that much of an effect. This actually puts the machinations and plans of that god or that being directly into the game and now affects your character in a way that's going to change the outcome of the campaign. I love that sort of thing. And I wish that more clerics were fleshed out in that way. The back cover, so, and the credits are on the back. 
So we have art by Russ Nicholson, who is a classic OSR artist. Uh, Huargo, Gus L., and Matt Hildebrand, who did the layout and graphic design. Great job, Matt Hildebrand. This thing looks fantastic. So as usual, there's going to be links down in the description below for where you can get this yourself. Uh, I believe it comes in PDF or in print form, although the print form is just beautiful. It's a deluxe little thing, and I'm really looking forward to seeing more issues of this come out and this Dreamland setting getting fleshed out further and further. So check down in the description if you want to get it for yourself. And join me next Wednesday when I'm going to be taking another, another look at this. Well, I haven't looked at it before, but uh, it's a game that also has a dreamlike uh, setting to it. So this is The Nightmares Underneath, which is set in a OSR Arabia-like landscape. And it has a, a twist where all of the dungeons are invasions from the nightmare realm. So nightmares are like invading the land by creeping up from underneath and players have to delve into these dungeons and kill them essentially by solving them and resolving them so that they, the living and the waking world is no longer tormented by them. It's such a great little twist on the idea of how dungeons work and why there would be dungeons. I'm really looking forward to getting into it. Hope you stick around for that. And thanks especially should go out to all of my Patreon subscribers who are keeping the channel going. Those guys are awesome. And uh, it's because of them that I'm able to keep doing this week after week. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you guys next time.